Okay. So, today we are going to talk about noise. Um, although we have covered noise um, in some detail in the analog class, uh, I want to go through that one more time uh, because it is where people have a lot of hard time and there, there are a lot of nuances when it comes to RF circuits. So, we will address all those. Um, the stuff that we I have already covered, I will speed up through that and I will spend more time on new things uh, which are related to this class. Okay? So, today I am going to start talking about noise. What is noise? Uh, you know the noise is uh, the definition by definition or by use is a, is a lower limit of the signal okay? uh, that can be amplified without a degradation or quality. Okay? So, every element will have its own noise because of its physical properties and then you are applying some signal on top of it. If your signal is below that noise level, then it will be corrupted, right. So, for example, all of you are talking in this classroom, right. Then let us assume for a minute that you are talking at the same or whatever amplitude, whatever the overall noise, over, if, I, if I put a microphone and record your sound, it will sound like noise. You know, you are all talking in different, different languages, let us say. And then we will just record the sound of of this uh, classroom, it will look like noise uh, because it is not correlated. Every person is talking in their own mother tongue and they are talking different language, whatever, uh, different words, whatever, right. And then we record that and it will be all combined together to give you some, sp some spectrum plus you will, uh, uh, you will see some, you know, noise on the oscilloscope, right. Now, if somebody talks at the same amplitude and other person is listening in presence of this sound, then you will not be able to make out what is going on. But as that other person starts talking louder, 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 right, at certain point in presence of the noise that you are creating, you can, you can still listen to that person and make, uh, make sense out of it. You can, you can understand what that person is saying, okay. So, that is kind of the intuition behind noise, right. So, in, um, in, in terms of circuits, what is really going on is let us say we draw a very simple circuit, okay, and we have a resistor. Okay, resistor R. Now, if you apply a voltage VB here plus minus, then what do we expect? You expect, what is the current that you expect? Can somebody tell me what is the value of this current? VB divided by R, right, Ohm's law. That is what you expect. Now, in reality, you will not get that. You, you will get some, some noise along, along with it, right. And that is because of the, the property of the, of the material, there is uh, electrons are moving around, you know, in general on an average they are going in that direction at certain rate. But then um, if you look at each time point, then you will have some fluctuation along with it. So, the, even though the noise, uh, this, this, um, the waveform looks noisy, uh, what you would see is the average value of this is going to be Vb divided by R, okay. So, this noise is random. Uh, whatever you see, but the uh, the average power is not okay. That's the key thing you have to remember. And average power is given of the noise is given by limit t goes to infinity um, one over t integral of n square t dt okay from zero to t. So um, t should be long enough to capture the lowest frequency uh, content uh, that you are interested in. Okay, and in frequency domain, what we do? We pretty much uh, zero to infinity. This is your S X F D of F is equal to again. This is same limit T uh, goes to infinity one over T integral zero to T X square T uh, D T. That's the way you are writing. So this part is called power spectral density. okay of x of t. You are all familiar with this right, I am kind of redo, re, 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 um, uh, repeating the stuff that we have already learned. Now, if we, if we plot the power spectral density okay, x, s of x, f, then uh, in the spectrum, I mean you will get two sided spectrum, okay, plus and minus, this is f plus and this is minus and this is two sided spectrum, we generally use it for graphical purposes, 
So when we are dealing with receiver architectures, there we would use for graphical purposes, we'll use two-sided spectrum. However, for um, uh, convenience and um, more useful is uh, the single-sided spectrum, which is called SSB. And here basically what happens is, um, okay, I should have drawn it a little bit differently. About the same and then this is going to be um, S of X F is going to be 6 dB higher uh, rather than 6 dB let us say factor of 2 for now. Factor of 2 okay and this is called one sided spectrum. Now this is used for circuits analysis okay and also if you look at noise measurements uh, on the um, you know, on the equipment, noise calculations on the equipment, they are all done using uh, uh, using single sided spectrum. Okay. Now let us look at um, really fundamental stuff. Um, um, I mean I am just going to recap it for the sake of continuity. Um, if you look at a resistor, right, R, then we show voltage noise as what is the value? You remember V n square is equal to 4 k t r okay, into delta f, delta f being the bandwidth in which you are looking at the thing, no, signal and then if you look at Norton, this is Thevenin equivalent and if you look at Norton equivalent then how do you show the noise current, this is r, this is let us say plus minus, okay. the current is i n square is going to be given by 4 k t divided by r. Okay delta f okay and how is this um, generally you show um, v n square divided by delta f that is what you are showing and then this is shown as volt square per hertz okay and current i n square divided by delta f and it is specified as m square per hertz okay hertz being the bandwidth in which you are integrating the noise. So bandwidth is very critical where you are uh, making this uh, measurement. Okay, uh, everybody knows what the co co coefficients are. K is Boltzmann constant. Okay, and that is 1.38, 10 to the power minus 23 units joules per Kelvin. Okay, and T is again temperature in centigrade Kelvin. Okay, yeah. So very important. Otherwise, you'll get wrong answers. Remember. Okay. Now um, you also define RMS. noise voltage density or current density for that and generally that is defined as V n divided by square root of f. Okay. So that will be equal to 4 k t r square root of that okay. and here we the unit is V r m s divided by root hertz. Sometimes you see root hertz, sometimes you will see V square. So I just wanted you to be familiar with all these numbers. Okay, so if you take a value a resistor R equal to one k, let's say, okay, then V n R m s divided by root hertz value noise value is going to be if you put four k t times one thousand and take square root of that, you will get four nano volts per root hertz. So good number to remember. So you don't have to remember the constants. And this is at room temperature, okay. So this is at, at room temperature, okay. T equal to 300 degrees Kelvin. Now, if you plot this, okay, um, over frequency, what you will see is V n square divided by delta F, and this is F. You look, it will look flat, okay. That is the number we have. And what is this number? What is the value of this spectrum? Don't be afraid. Yes, yeah, correct. 16 into 10 to the power minus 18 volt square per hertz. The reason I am asking this question was because it is written V square and here we talked about 4 nanovolt per square root of hertz. Okay, That is the reason I was asking this question. Now what is this value if I integrate it in let us say 1 hertz bandwidth, okay. let us say this is 1 hertz anywhere, this is the number I am going to get. 
okay. And this is since it's flat over frequency, it's also called as white noise. Okay. Now this number uh, is called spot noise. If you if you just look at this one one point um, integrated in one hertz uh, bandwidth, then that's called spot noise. Okay. The other terms are integrated noise. So integrated noise means there is a FH and FL. You know, high uh, and then you integrate that noise over over that bandwidth. Okay. Any questions so far? It's all basic stuff, right? But if you still, if you have a question, then ask me. Pavan, everything okay so far? Okay. You you remember uh, all of you somewhat remember what we did in the previous class, or it's completely wiped out. All of you have new hard disk uh, for the new class. Okay. That's why I was trying to do this one more time. Okay. Okay. So um, other obvious stuff we went through is um, effect of uh, transfer function. So if you have a filter or some kind of frequency, um, you know, um, uh, some kind of filtering device, then and if you if you put in white noise at the input spectrum, then you will get filtered noise. Okay. It will it will follow the transfer function of, of this particular thing, so the you'll get low pass filter noise. Okay, so if you have let's say this is S of Y F and this is S of X F, S of X F being the PSD of the noise you're inputting into the system into the filter, and S of Y is the PSD at the output of the filter. Okay, so then you will see the PSD at the output should be equal to S of X um, F and then H of F. H of f is the transfer function, correct? And this is true in the LTI system, linear time invariant system. Okay. In the RF circuits, uh, we use term called available quite a lot. So I wanted to introduce that concept. Available, everything is available. What is available, right? Let's say you have um, ten dollars in your pocket. So what's your available income? Ten dollars, right? I mean. You are not giving, you do not have million dollars to give. Uh, so, it is like available, how much is available from a resistor. So, um, in, in case of the circuit elements though, that is not, uh, you know, it is not uh, a matching ideology, but let me explain. So, let us say you have a resistor, noisy resistor, okay, R, and then what would be the noise? We will put a voltage source here, Vn square, okay, that would be 4 KTR depending upon square root of f4 whatever now i i will i will connect another resistor of equal value because we all know to get maximum power out what do you have to do you have to match right that's what we learned during matching lessons so we match it with another resistor so that we can get maximum noise power out of out of this thing out of this resistor okay so in this particular case though the resistor is noiseless resistor hypothetical okay and now I am going to get um, maximum power out of this, uh, you know, this noisy resistor. Okay, and what is the available noise power? So that's what is called available. Okay, so that's the maximum power transfer, and that happens when, let's say, if this was RS, and if this was RS, RS and RL. And at R s equal to R l, that's what will happen. Okay, so in this particular example, what we could say is uh, P available noise is given by. First of all, this V n uh, would show up over here, and that would be V n divided by two. Okay, and then divide by V square divided by R. Okay. Make sense? V square divided by R. Uh, the, the noise voltage appearing will be V n uh, divided by 2 because there are two resistive dividers. So, um, this is what you will get and that value is going to be what is V n? 4 k t R divided by 2 and square of that and divide by R. So, uh, and then we multiply this by uh, bandwidth on top, right, because you are trying to measure the. Uh, Ah, good, 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 excellent, good catch, very good catch, I made a mistake right here. So this should be uh, 4 KTR and there should be 4 on the bottom, this 
divided by 2 should show up as correct and Vn square will be 4 KTR and then we will multiply by bandwidth. So, 4, 4 R, R goes away and what do we get? KTB. Okay. So, this has significance as we develop the story further you will see it. Okay. So, uh, the available noise power P available okay, is given by KTB. Okay. So, it is proportional to temperature, absolute temperature and is also proportional to bandwidth. And what is another unique thing is it has no dependence on the resistor value itself. Okay. Okay. So, um, how do we reduce the available noise power? You reduce the temperature and that may not be in your control many times. Although many times people uh, go to extremes like cooling circuits to uh, reduce the noise. I mean if, if the application is such that you really have to do it, then you could do it. Uh, however, the easiest thing is to reduce the bandwidth. Okay. So, um, basically uh, as RF designers, you know having wideband circuits is not necessarily a good idea. Because if you have a wide band circuit, that means you have to take into account the entire spectrum noise and this is the reason. So, you should uh, kind of limit, use the minimum bandwidth that is acceptable for your design because then the signal will come in through, but noise is limited to that bandwidth. Okay. So, conceptually that is what I am trying to tell you that uh, least required bandwidth, uh, you know, for the job you should do. Now, let us put some numbers. So, this P available noise is KTB. So, let us in 1, one hertz band, bandwidth, if you if you take this value then it will be, um, it will come out to be at 300 K degree K. It will be, I uh, will just give you the number 4.14 and 10 to the power minus 21 watts per hertz. Okay. Now, this number is kind of not meaningful to us because the way the number comes out. So, what are we what are we comfortable about when we when it comes to power number? What is the unit that we like to use? Huh? DBM, that is what I was looking for and that is reference to 1 milliwatt. So, what do we do? We, we take this number and then we divide by 1 milliwatt and we take for DBM 10 log. Okay. 10 log. So, if you take this number, then it comes out to be minus 174 dBm and since we are looking at 1 hertz bandwidth, it is per unit hertz. Okay, That is what this number comes down and this we will pop up again and again, again and again uh, as we go along. So, that is the reason I am doing this calculation uh, for you. Okay. So, keep this number in your head and what is this number? Minus 174 dBm per hertz and that is just kT, the coefficient kT. All right, integrated noise uh, in 1 hertz bandwidth. The other important part is um, if you have a circuit, if you have let us say passive circuit, okay. And um, for example, um, let us say you had just used LC um, circuit for matching, right. Now, there we do not have any um, and let us say, let us assume that they do not have any loss in that uh, lossy element, like there is no dissipation in that. So, then then it does not impact our noise calculations. Okay. However, as soon as there is some kind of loss in a, in a circuit like black box, you will impact noise figure because whenever there is a lossy element, what do we have? Some kind of resistor where there is a dissipation that is happening and whenever there is a dissipation, you have you are you are introducing noise into the system. Okay. So, uh, whenever there is a lossy circuit, okay, you should see impact on noise, you will say them noisy. Okay. Now, you may have a, uh, let us say we are looking at the this passive circuit from only one side and let us say this particular uh, impedance looks like you know z out is equal to um, let us just say real part of z out uh, plus imaginary part of z out and j. 
that's what it's going to look like. Right? This is the complex part and that's the real part. So, um, the complex part really doesn't contribute to noise. It's the resistive element, right, which will contribute to the noise. So, uh, for a, for a, if you know that uh, for a passive circuit, the output impedance looks like this, then you can safely uh, draw the Vn square noise of that equal to 4 kT times real part of V out, okay, the lossy element and that would be the effective uh, Thevenin equivalent looking at the output of that net, okay. Now, this is, uh, you know, it is not necessarily just limited to lump circuits, it is also uh, applicable to, applicable to other circuits and one example for that would be, um, let us say you have a power amplifier, the power amplifier will transmit uh, power. Uh, radiate power at high frequency, so the other person can receive it. Then um, the power amplifier will be, you know, transmitting power Vtx, let us say, okay. and it will be transmitting to an antenna. Okay. So, when we talk about antenna, what is really going on there at a, uh, you know, at a inside, inside the antenna, okay. So, inside the antenna, basically we are converting the applied voltage, that electromagnetic wave into something that you are transmitting radiating, right. So, there is some work that is being done to transmit the electromagnetic waves over the air and something, some work is done meaning there is some loss, right, because uh, whatever that energy that you are, you are shipping from your source is being transmitted uh, over the antenna, using the antenna uh, on the air waves, whichever way it is. So, that action can be looked at as some kind of a resistance or a loss, okay, and that is called radiation resistance of the antenna. Okay, all right. So, then uh, when you do the design part, what you would do is you would say, okay, I have Vtx and then I am just applying it to a resistance, R radiation. And this radiation resistance can be the impedance of the antenna, maybe 50 ohm, maybe 75 ohm, depending upon what the design is, okay. Right. And similarly, when we, when we look at, uh, you know, antenna connected to a low noise amplifier, right, then there also we do we have radiation resistance of the antenna and this is the, uh, you know, 4 kT R radiation, okay, and that goes into uh, our LNA, okay. Does it make sense? Okay, all right. So, this is the key point, Vn uh, square of antenna is equal to 4 kT R radiation. And again, this can be delta F over delta F. Now, this is probably you have done it, I do not know, I would, I would guarantee you, if you have taken other classes, you have gone through it a few times already, but I will uh, just go through the result right now. Um, Let us say we have a noisy resistor, okay. Then the noisy resistor, will the capacitor have any noise? It does not. These, the, the, uh, the noise comes from the lossy elements and not from the uh, inductor and capacitor, unless they have some loss built into them. Let us say the capacitor has some resistance, which is the dielectric uh, representation, very large resistance, then we have to take into account that. Or the inductor has some wire resistance, like a physical significance, some kind of physical significance has to be there, then it will have a loss. But otherwise, if you look at ideal L and C, it should not have any uh, uh, any noise associated with it, okay. So, if we look at a resistor and a capacitor, this network, so this we know, it looks like a low pass filter, right, pretty much. And what would be at low frequency, what do you expect? The PSD value, I am plotting Vn square by delta F, this should be 4 kT R, correct. And then it will start following the filter characteristics. Uh, that 3 dB frequency is 1 over uh, RC, things like that, right, uh, omega 3 dB, okay, all right. So, uh, what you could do is you could integrate the noise in this entire um, output of the filter, okay. Um, and if you integrate that, what you would see is, uh, should I go through the derivation, maybe at least initial step, yes, no, or is already well known. Are you familiar with the derivation? Yes, no. Yes is this way and no is this way. In India, I have to tell that to people because they are always somewhere in between and I am trying to figure out 
what are you trying to tell me? So, can you tell me? Yes, no? Yes? No, okay, good. So, if if you do not know, you catch a hold of them, okay. So, when we integrate the integrate the noise in this uh, bandwidth, then the fav your favorite result is V out square is equal to K T over C. And the way to do that is just write the expression for the filter transfer function, make sure you square it H F square and then you put uh, chain of variables and integrate from 0 to infinity and you will get 1 over 1 plus x square dx and then tan inverse of x pi by 2 and then uh, you will see the result right pi or k t over c. And this you must have done it in even the mixed signal class because you uh, you are trying to do sampling of the um, you know R c sampling that is when you do that too ok. Hmm. Hmm. No, no the single sideband is half of that. No, whatever the 4, uh, sorry, single sideband is 4 KTR and then double sideband is actually half of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all the calculations we are doing are all single sideband, ok. Right. So, this is again unit is whole square. So, what is the insight here? What can we do to reduce the noise? increase the capacitor obviously, it is independent of the resistor, but then when you increase the capacitor what happens? You reduce the bandwidth of the circuit and again it kind of comes back to the same, uh, same thing. Basically reduce the bandwidth and lower the bandwidth, the better is your noise performance, ok. okay. And then there is another uh, term that is used uh, is something called noise bandwidth, which I want to just specify. Okay. So, noise bandwidth is something where you if you look at 4 k t r and you specify f noise bandwidth ok and if you look at the area under this it should be equal to k t over c ok f n b w is equal to k t over c. k t over c is as if the filter was existing that you would integrate all this noise power and then effective noise bandwidth. So, you are assuming that noise only exists in that noise bandwidth and is 0 after that, there is no noise. And it is convenient many times uh, to use the calculation this way and the value of f noise bandwidth is given by 1 divided by 4 r c ok and that is equal to pi by 2 f 3 d. 1 over R c is the uh, omega 3 dB and omega has 2 pi. So, you have to take into account that also. Any questions so far? We are going to move into different domain now. Huh. Yeah, I am just showing you for this particular example. I mean you can have another example. So, all you have to do is you integrate whatever was the low frequency noise in that bandwidth and then you figure out the equivalent. Um, uh, you know, so it is for convenience the noise bandwidth number is used, although I have not used it as much as I would have seen. Uh, there is noise temperature, there is noise bandwidth, so uh, variety, I am just introducing the concept. The concept is same, basically you take the total integrated noise and then you assume it is uh, it's constant only over that noise bandwidth and you look at the equivalence between the two, ok. So, uh, next we are going to move into MOSFETs, ok. So, the noise basics here are um, I would not spend as much time into the theory of noise, uh, but more so um, the results ok. So, if you, MOSFET is a voltage controlled uh, resistor. So, your the current noise is the drain to source. This is the what we model as I n square and that is given by 4 k t gamma g d o ok times delta f. So, this is a little bit newer compared to the definition we have used before and I will add, I will I will kind of uh, elaborate on that now. So, what is GDO? GDO is drain to source conductance ok. Now, this gamma is empirical value. Uh, yeah, I am going to go through. It is a drain to source conductance. 
okay. Now, I am going to define it for different different regions. So, this is a little more advanced definition than what you did in the previous class, okay. In the previous class, we just used GM value. So, that is why I am going into this little bit more in detail, okay. So, uh, the this empirical value is something called excess noise coefficient. So, uh, in non saturation region, what is our uh, equation for the current? Id is equal to mu n C ox W by L into you have forgotten Vgs minus Vt, Vds minus Vds by 2, ok. All right. So, we calculate drain to source conductance by doing del I d by del V d s and what is that equal to mu n C ox W by L V g s minus V t times um, yeah that is it minus uh, V d s right correct. Now, I can define this at V d s equal to 0, ok. So, that would look like if you if you draw the transfer characteristics, you are you are looking for this slope over here, ok, got it, ok. So, um, in this particular case if we substitute V d s equal to 0, this will become mu n C ox W by L V g s minus V t. All right, and uh, so you can you can substitute that in our original equation, and this is during the triode region, or this is in the non-saturation uh, region of operation. Okay, and um, and the the excess noise coefficient for non-saturation region is equal to one because it just looks like a resistance at that point. Okay, clear. Now let's look at saturation region. In saturation region, um, for long channel devices, um, IND square is equal to 4 kT, gamma is given by 2 third, okay, and this GDO times delta F, and uh, this GDO is you can you can write this GDO as which is this value right. What does that resemble? Do you remember the three expression for the GM? Okay. So, this resembles a GM expression. So, this GDS is equal to GM. Okay. The sorry GDO is equal to GM. There are two different things they just you know the, the equation maps out to the GM value that we are used to. Is that part clear? So, the the in the in the in the long channel case we would write it as 4 k t 2 third g m delta f which is what you are familiar with for the long channel saturated device all right. And for short channel device everybody understands what short channel is right. You bring source and drain closer 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 and that is what a short channel is. In short channel case things get really worse, ok. So, um, due to the short channel effect basically the electric field is going beyond uh, you know the channel area is going into the source. So, um, you have this E critical that we talked about velocity saturation effect and all those things. So, there is work done being uh, there is more work done than normal conditions under these conditions. So, this uh, what do you think will happen to gamma? Will it increase or decrease? it will increase yeah. So, gamma is typically uh, 2 to 3 ok, not 2 divided by 3, but range of 2 to 3 ok. So, you can see the noise is lot higher in the short channel devices. Uh, next term I am going to introduce is gate noise, which we have not looked at before. So, pay attention ok. 
So gate noise is um, if you if you look at the gate of the MOSFET. source, drain and then this is our gate, okay, and this is our channel, okay. So um, if, you, if you look at the drain to source traffic of electrons, right, um, these electrons are flowing back and forth and of course there is noise associated with that, right. So that noise uh, is also uh, this uh, fluctuating, it will fluctuate the gate potential, okay, because it is capacitively coupled also, right. There is, a, there is a capacitance from gate to the channel and the channel is fluctuating. So then you will see some, um, uh, some fluctuations in the gate potential, okay. So that is, uh, that results in noisy gate current, okay, and I will show you the model behind it. So it is model like this. And this is your CGS, let's say. And uh, the gate resistance we uh, we did in last class, GG, if you remember. Uh, and that this is your I N S I N G. I'll explain this. Okay, just a minute. Okay, so this is uh, done. This is called Van der Zeele's model. Okay, it's not capital D, it's small d. And ing square is given by 4 kt delta, okay, and gg times delta f. Now let me explain. The gg part, okay, is the impedance looking into the gate. If you remember, um, and if you remember last last week's class, um, what was that about? If you remember transit time effects, we learned. If you if you increase the gate potential suddenly then it takes some work for the channel to be formed, okay, and there is some work done which means there is some dissipation, which means there is some real component of the resistance, okay. I mean this is all the stuff that Van der Zyl did. I mean I don't know how he dreamed it up, but it's amazing that it, it really matches the, the measurement, measured data, right. But there is an intuitive explanation that he has given. And uh, so that's the GG. Uh, the real part of the impedance looking into the gate and that we learned last week uh, that was gg was given by equal to omega square cgs square divided by phi times gdo now again this gdo came into play okay what is gdo conductance from drain to source um, when uh, vds equal to 0 you know you plot that out and it just happens to be equal to gm the expression happens to be gm okay so, um, and this is all due to the NQS effect and delta is given by is 4 divided by 3 which is uh, you know uh, gate noise coefficient uh, in long channel device. So since this has omega square if you, if you see right, so this noise increases with frequency and it is also called blue noise. Okay. Now let us do some calculations. Um, if you look at this model, so this is CGS and this is your GG and this is our ING square, okay. So we can do a serial to a parallel to serial conversion and what are we going to get? we can get something like this. So this would be our CGS and this would be your RG and this would be V and G, okay. So what is the Q of this network? Can somebody tell me? It is omega C R, right, okay. And in this case R should be? because it is R is across the capacitor, so R should be large. So the Q is large, so which means should be the numerator or denominator? Numerator, right? So it should be omega C RG. Everybody agrees? 
and that is equal to omega CGS divided by GG. GG is conductance, okay. G is conductance, R is resistance, okay. So then we can uh, write the expression for RG. What is the value of RG? Now we are converting it to series. So it gets divided by what? Series to parallel conversion, parallel to series conversion. Huh? 1 plus Q square, it is going to get divided, right? When you go, because series you want the resistance to be very small. So uh, RG is given by um, whatever, uh, I am going to keep GG on the denominator because uh, and 1 plus Q square. Is this part clear? I am kind of taking jumps here, uh, but this is assuming you have kind of absorbed all the material on matching networks, okay? All right. So if we, if we write this expression, it is going to be um, GG, 1 plus what is Q? Uh, omega CGS, um, omega square CGS square divided by GG square. Everybody with me so far? Okay. And what do we do for convenience? We ignore 1 plus because we know Q is large. And then what do you get? You get GG divided by omega square CGS square. Everybody with me? Calculation makes sense? Okay. And now we can, um, so this is our RG value. And what does that also look like? I can substitute for GG, which is, uh, where is GG value? Right here, okay. Omega square CGS square divided by 5 GDO. So let's substitute that. Omega square CGS square divided by 5 GDO and divide by um, omega square. C G S square. So this will go away and what you will get is 1 divided by 5 times G D O. Okay. So this is R G and the corresponding noise is going to be V N G is equal to 4 K T in this case delta times R G times delta F which is and, and this delta this excess noise coefficient is generally 2 times the gamma. Okay, so uh, in case of uh, in case of long channel devices, uh, what was the uh, what was the gamma? Two thirds for long channel devices. In this case, it will be four thirds uh, for the gate noise. And uh, for short channel devices, what was the gamma? Gamma was two to three value. Here it will be four to six. Okay, so you have to worry about the short channel and long channel. Uh, quite a lot when it comes to noise because as you as you uh, you know we do back of the envelope calculation based on all the numbers we know and you simulate something and you suddenly see noise figure is lot higher or noise numbers are lot higher so just go go back in and kind of pay close attention to am i using small channel length uh, in in my device and then you know you can play with that number uh, to see if things improve okay Let us talk about flicker noise. So in flicker noise, uh, why does flicker noise happen? There is something going on at the surface of the gate and, um, and the channel that surface over there. There are lots of charge trappings and things like that and they are going at their own pace. You know, they are releasing, they are absorbing, all that stuff creates noise because uh, it is it's like noise, uh, uh, you know, affecting your VT, let us say. Okay. The VT will change because of the interface state. So um, this flicker noise, uh, intuitively what happens is um, it, it depends on the area of the transistor. So if you have a larger area of the transistor, then the effect tends to get averaged out, okay. Let us say you will have uh, a certain area and the flicker noise value is given by some number. And if you have twice the area, then what will happen? The flicker noise, uh, you know, the, the V square will go down by factor of 2 because you are averaging the noise um, over a larger area. I mean, there are a lot more surface states um, which are trappings uh, and their effect gets averaged out, okay. So the key uh, element there is um, it is proportional to 1 over F. Okay, also called 1 over F noise, which means at lower frequencies, it keeps increasing and also is proportional to 1 over WL, 
W L being the width of the device and length of the device. So, if you increase the area of the transistor, then the flicker noise will reduce. Okay, this is what we have learned, and the model for that is pretty simple. This is what we show as V n square 1 over f, okay, and this is given by uh, V n square 1 over f is equal to k 1 over f. It is a empirical coefficient uh, k w l and c ox and 1 over f, okay. So, this is the this is the expression that gives you flicker noise um, and uh, when we look at i n square 1 over f, there you would have a transistor and you would have the flicker noise 1 over f and what does that look like? It will just get multiplied by g m square, okay, because it is at the on the other side. So, it is going to be g m square k 1 over f divided by W L C ox 1 over f, okay. Is that clear? So, this k value um, 1 over f uh, changes a lot from the from process to process and um, it, uh, it is an indicator of how good the process is. So, if the process is extremely clean then the this 1 over f noise coefficient can be uh, you know smaller. And this uh, 1 over f noise coefficient can be 10 to the power minus 28 c square meter square, okay. And k this is for uh, PMOS transistor and for NMOS transistor, it is actually a lot worse. It can be uh, you know uh, 20 to 50 times uh, k 1 over f uh, NMOS or PMOS. The reason for that is in PMOS the, the transport is happening under the surface, it does not happen at the surface. Um, so, uh, that is the reason you get better uh, noise prop 1 over f noise properties in, in, uh, in case of a PMOS transistor, okay. So, when we plot the 1 over f noise, it is going to look like this. So, this is our thermal noise of the device. And then you will see the plot that looks like this, which is 1 over f noise. And what are we plotting? V n square divided by f in log scale, and this is also in log scale f, okay. The point at which they meet, this particular point, right, uh, right here, that is called f c or corner frequency. So, at f c the value of 1 over f noise is equal to thermal noise. So, let us write the value um, flicker noise corner ok k 1 over f divided by w l c ox 1 over f c now because I am measuring the spot noise at uh, that particular frequency is equal to 4 k t gamma 1 over g m, okay. So, when we compute f c, rearranging the terms you will see it is equal to 1 over f divided by uh, w l c ox and then um, the g m comes in the numerator and you get 4 k t gamma, all right. Now, how can I uh, rewrite this thing? What does this look like? Huh? Louder? Omega f t, right? Yeah, basically f t of the transistor, yeah. So, this is going to look like um, f of c is equal to um, k 1 over f and this is 4 k t gamma times omega t. This is our g m over c g s value, okay. So, what does that tell? This, this, this gives us a lot of insight, this particular expression. What is it telling you? With process corner, what is really going on? What are we trying to this number? As we as we get to not process corner, but as we uh, go to uh, you know 
higher and higher resolution processes. Let us say, let us say we go from 180 nanometer to 65 nanometer to 28 nanometer. What do you think happens to omega t, ft of the transistor? It will increase, right? Because that is why we are uh, we are in that game, we are trying to increase the ft. So, however, if you increase the ft, what will happen? The flicker noise corner will, it will also increase. And then what will happen is if you if you look at this particular chart, it will start looking like this. Okay. This part does not change as, as much, but the flicker noise corner will keep changing. So, you will see that um, in the these high resolution processes, your FTs can be tens of megahertz, which is you know not as good. So, uh, so what would you do if that happens? You would just increase the size of the device and then you would kind of simulate a lower end process. If you increase the W and L of the device, then in a high resolution process, you are creating a lower end device. I think you get that, right? I mean, you are just increasing the area of the device and you are trying to improve your flicker noise. So, uh, you can still, uh, you know, get low noise uh, performance. Yeah. That is the next thing I am going to talk about. It is an interview question. Okay. So, this 1 over f noise, right, um, uh, it is uh, it's really important something like this, right. And this is V n square uh, by f and this is your frequency both are log log, okay. Now, um, I mean many times, uh, you know, you are working on extremely low frequency circuits, okay. What would be the low frequency, lowest frequency you can think of? You know, earthquakes, right. They are extremely low frequency signals you have to process. So, there you are operating somewhere out there. So, there you have to really worry about the flicker noise of the devices, okay, because you are trying to integrate noise and signal at extremely low frequencies because it is happening so slowly, you are trying to measure earth's vibration. So, uh, the seismic activity circuits, they are very low frequencies. We are not used to any other like audio and all those things, right, there you do not have to worry about it as much, okay. In RF applications, however, okay, um, the flicker noise can be of concern, okay. The reason is that uh, a flicker noise of the circuit, when you multiply it with an oscillator frequency or something like that, it gets upconverted. So, for example, if I multiply this by a sinusoidal waveform, then you will end up with a waveform that looks like this, something like this. You will have flicker noise around it and as you will learn in future, uh, that can be issue. Uh, in many circuits because the, 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 the flicker noise that we were looking at very low frequencies is now up converted to high frequencies. So, we have to deal with that. The, the next part is, let us say you are just doing a low noise amplifier, which is at the front end, okay. Uh, would the flicker noise be important at that case? All I am doing is I am just amplifying the signal and my LNA uh, is amplifying, let us say, signal at 5 gigahertz. Do you think the flicker noise would be important? Signal is at 5 gigahertz and all this stuff is happening below maybe 10, giga, 10 megahertz or so. So, it really does not bother us. It is only when we do frequency translation, then we have to worry about all those things, okay. So, for LNA performance, flicker noise nobody cares, okay. Um, so, you care about it when it is getting translated or you are either doing a LNA for seismic activity. Then you are looking at, you know, sub hertz type of region where you are trying to amplify the signal. Is that part clear, okay. And there are techniques to mitigate the flicker noise. I mean, there are many, many techniques to mitigate flicker noise. One of them is, as uh, Shiva said, you know, chopper stabilization. So, you, you chop it um, and uh, so, if you look at differential circuit, for example, right, I mean, I will just deviate from the class right now. Um, what happens is, if you, if you chop it, uh, you know, does everybody know what chopping means? No? Chopping means you have a signal coming in. And for half the time, you, you reverse the signal, for other half the time, you, you keep it this way. And then when you are looking at the signal, you do exactly opposite, okay. Now, when you do something like that, the flicker noise will get upconverted, but the signal will not get upconverted. So, there is a magic trick uh, that you can do. And generally, the chopping techniques, they are very useful when it comes to DC offsets or flicker noise, anything that is low frequency circuits, okay. So, that is just a circuit uh, related uh, uh, thing. Now, coming back to Hamid's question, okay. If you plot the flicker noise over frequency, something like this, let us say this is 1, um, uh, one hertz and let us say at 1 hertz the number is uh, 
one micro uh, volt square per hertz. Okay. Now, if I keep doing this, this is 0.1 hertz, this is 0 0.01 hertz, this is 1 millihertz, this is 0.1 millihertz, something like this if I keep doing and come comes the point where I am at 1 micro hertz. Okay. Are you getting what I am trying to do? All I am doing is I am plotting on the log scale. I am trying to address Hamid's question. Okay. All I am doing is in the log scale I am going by a factor of 10. Okay. And what you would expect is this would be a linear 1 over f performance and then what you would see at 1 micro hertz you will see 1 volt square per hertz and you will see that. Okay. However, there is a caveat which is what I am trying to explain um, because that is the nature of the flicker noise. Okay. So, the, the question the interview can I mean uh, interviewer can stump you saying that hey this is 1 volts per hertz how is your circuit working at low frequency because there is flicker noise all the time right. Are not you worried because at DC I will have a very large flicker noise and my circuits would not work that they, it will be much higher than even the supply voltage. So, it is a way to trick you into thinking that way. However, what happens is what is happening to observation time as you go down? Yeah, yeah. I mean you have to observe that circuit over such a long period of time, it will go in years for that matter and many times the circuit may not be even operational in that particular mode for that many years. Okay. So, that is one, one point uh, which you should argue and say that this is what happens you have to increase the observation time because as you are going lower and lower in frequencies and also um, nevertheless what is more interesting or important is the integrated noise. Okay. And what is the integrated noise in uh, uh, the integrated noise definition is k 1 over f divided by f I am just putting one constant here and df and you integrate it from f of low to f of h. Okay. Now, what is the value of this you are going to get? You will get k 1 over f and what will be the term you are going to get? ln, ln of f h over f l and this ln is your friend. Okay. Whenever you have log uh, here, it will reduce the imp impact of this ratio. Okay. So, I mean I can do the calculation for you, but you can convince yourself even if this goes into a million 1 e to the power 6, this number is still some manageable number. Okay. So, um, as you go down in frequencies this f h over f l will, uh, will, will be the same no matter where you go on that curve. Is that part clear? Okay. So, this is still a small number. Okay. Any questions so far? We kind of covered all the basics with small amount of details were necessary for RF circuits. Okay. So, now let us get into circuits. So, um, let us do circuit noise analysis. Okay. Let us say there are two amplifiers uh, and you want to compare them for noise performance right? and one of them has gain of 10 dB, the other one has 16 dB okay. or maybe they are slightly different then uh, it is very difficult to compare those two amplifiers okay, uh, by just looking at the noise spectrum at the output of the amplifier because we, you have to know the gain exact uh, gain. right? So, uh, what people do in circuit analysis is you always look at input referred. Okay. Input referred noise uh, is, uh, is the best way to do that because then the gain is out of the question. Okay. So, we will kind of work on that and we will be using that, uh, that input referred concept everywhere. Okay. So, the way to calculate input referred noise is you have a noisy circuit, then what you do is you take that circuit and make it completely noiseless. Okay. And then you draw these two equivalent sources, uh, this being I n square input referred uh, noise and this is input referred voltage. Okay. And then we are saying that oh this represents my entire uh, circuit um, and V n square and I n square both of them will uh, take care of effect of all the noise sources in the circuit. And when we when we do cadence simulations and things like that you can get these numbers okay, input refer noise voltage or current. Right? So, this is the way we do the analysis. Uh, the next term um, 
that I will introduce is called noise figure. Okay. Noise figure, I mean by the name suggest, if the number is high that means the circuit is noisy, right, because it has a high noise figure. The low noise figure is what we want. Now figure is just to compare uh, two blocks, right. So then uh, let us let's, uh, draw a very simplistic uh, block diagram, okay, and this is gain of G, okay, and then here I am going to uh, this is noise of the source Ns that is going in and this is Na is the input referred noise power and this Na represents actually this circuit just like what we did over here, okay. So you are kind of modeling everything at the input and then um, then we are saying that the gain G is noiseless. Now in this particular case, we uh, define noise figure as uh, total output noise power, okay, divided by total uh, output noise power due to source. Okay. Let me explain. So, the numerator has both source contribution as well as the circuits contribution. Is that clear? The denominator has only the source contribution because it is coming from the source and there is nothing I can do about it, right. If you have noise coming in the input of the block then um, you know you have to deal with that noise. So, if I am not adding any noise into the uh, my, my my circuit is so low noise that only thing that I am going to see at the output of this uh, amplifier is the source noise, okay. Then it is a very good amplifier even though I am seeing noise because the noise is coming from the source. Uh, there is nothing you can do about the noise coming from the source, okay. So, so this actually um, I should call it rather than noise figure, I should call it noise factor, okay. Figure is a little bit different. So, apologize for that. Let us call it noise factor although both of them have NF, okay. This is called noise factor. So, noise factor again, if, uh, if the circuit is noiseless, then what would be the noise factor equal to 0 or 1? One? 1, okay. So, if uh, and if I take, uh, uh, if I take uh, dB measurement, then what would be the noise factor, noise figure, okay. So, noise factor, factor is a numerical number ratio and noise figure is in dBs. Okay, so noise figure is equal to 10 log noise factor, all right. So 0 dB is good and 1 is good, okay. If noise factor is 1, that means you have a uh, very low noise circuit or if you have noise figure which is 0 dB, that means you have perfect circuit. Is that clear? Just definition. Now, um, so in this particular case, what will happen is, can you tell me the noise factor? What would be the total output noise power? Let us say the power gain is G, then, uh, then you would have G times Na plus Ns, right, and divide by Ns, G times Ns, okay. If I did not have uh, Na, uh, circuit is completely noiseless, then it will be G times Ns. So then G, G goes away and what do we get? 1 plus Na divided by Ns and that is our noise factor. Now the other definition also that falls out of it is, um, it is very used in communication systems is uh, what is the signal to noise ratio? Let us say we apply a signal uh, of, this is Sn is the signal power at input. Then SNR at the input is given by SN divided by which one? NS, okay, because this is what is coming in along with the noise uh, that, that I am going to get in, 
in this. Is that part clear? That is the input SNR and what is the SNR at the output? What is the value of the signal is going to be? What would be the value of the signal over here? No, no, signal. I am putting in SN. What should you see at the output? G times SN, right? So that we need to do that. This is G times SN. And what is the noise power at the output? G times NS plus NA, okay? So this would be. G times NA plus NA, okay, right. So, this is our SNR at the output and now if we take a look at SNR at input divided by SNR at output, what does that come out to be? SN divided by NS divided by GG goes away and here we have SN divided by NS plus NA and you get the same result, right which is 1 plus Na divided by Ns, which is noise factor, okay. So, this is another definition which signifies why it is important because um, it, it also depends on what is the SNR coming into the system. So, no, uh, uh, that is important, okay. So, the noise factor is also defined one more time is SNR at input divided by SNR at output. So, noise factor kind of tells you how much SNR is being degraded, right, uh, at the output. And uh, I already defined the dB value, right. This is factor and then figure is 10 log of that number. Next thing we are going to do is cascade it. Noise figure. Okay. So, here what we are doing is this is the source noise and this is NA1 corresponding to this device, right, G1. Now, I am going to add another device here which will have NA2 and G2. G3. Are you getting the hang of it? So, each stage will add noise into the system and this is pretty much what you do as RF designers, okay. You have whole, you have a receiver lineup. This is the receiver lineup, okay. So, I am um, at a, I am showing this to you at an abstract level, but as we, as we go along, we will refine this further. Okay. So, in this particular case, uh, this G1 may be LNA, this G2 may be a mixer, G3 may be a filter and things like that. Okay. It will keep going on like that. So, uh, here we have what we are modeling as each element G1 or G2 or G3, they have input referred noise which is identified as NA1, NA2 and NA3. Okay. Assumption here is that since we are dealing with powers, everything is matched, input and output are matched. Okay. So, I will just note down the assumption. So, then uh, we can write what is the total output noise power? Can somebody tell? What is the output noise power? First it is Na1 plus Ns times G1 plus Na2 times G2 plus Na3, right? And then we again multiply it by G3 and we keep going on like this. Make sense? Is this clear, the expression, the way I have written it down? Okay. And what is the, um, uh, the noise, uh, output noise power due to? Source resistance, it's due to source and that would be equal to? Finish? What would be the output noise power due to source? It is Ns times G1, G2, whatever that is, right. So, it will be G1, G2, whatever that is, okay. So, um, what you would see then is if we divide the two, which will give you noise factor, that will look like Pn out 
total divided by Pn out um, source. Okay, that would come out to be um, in this particular. Let's say take a three uh, three term example would be Ns times G1, G2, G3 plus Na1 times uh, G1, G2, G3, and then you'll have Na2 times G2, G3 plus Na3 times G3. I'm just expanding that further and divide it down by Ns times G1, G2, and G3. So, this you can rewrite as 1 plus Na1 divided by Ns plus Na2 divided by Ns times G1 plus Na3 divided by Ns divided by G1, G2. Make sense? Just algebra? All right. So, we can then uh, we know that Nf1. Nf1 is noise figure of only this guy. What is that Nf1 equal to? 1 plus Na1 divided by Ns. Only when I am looking at that device, right, in isolation. Because in RF design, um, the traditional RF design, you would buy components from different, different people, okay. So, you would buy one LNA from somebody, then you would buy a mixer from somebody things like that, another amplifier for somebody, right. And all of them have been standardized for either 50 ohm termination or 75 ohm termination, whatever, because you are using off the shelf components and they would be specified, my noise figure is this much, this guy's noise figure is this much, right. Now, when we put it all together, what is the effective noise figure of the entire chain and that is what we are doing right now, okay. All of them are matched properly at the interfaces because that simplifies the calculations a little bit, okay. So, the NF1 is derived as 1 plus Na1 divided by Ns, Nf2 will be derived as 1 plus Na2 divided by Ns and they are all uh, assuming each unit is uh, measured, each unit's noise figure is measured under match conditions, uh, right. So, this would be Na3 divided by Ns. So, with this, this is individual noise figure of each unit. Now, you can reformat this expression, it will look like 1 plus, what is this term? Nf1 minus 1, got it? What is this term? Is equal to plus Nf2 minus 1, correct? And divide by G1. What is the third term? Plus Nf3 minus 1 divided by G1, G2. Those are the gains, okay? And similarly, if we as we love to do it, uh, we can say Nfm minus 1 divided by G1, what would be the index of the G? M minus 1, which is critical, okay, one stage before, okay. So, this is a, this is something called freeze equation. What is an interesting uh, insight out of this, right? There is a insight out of this, which circuit is most important in a chain, first one and that is the reason we call it low noise amplifier. The first noise, first guy will decide how, what quality of uh, you know your receiver is going to be. So, it is extremely important to have low noise figure for the first stage and uh, because that will come right in front and everything else will get divided by the gain of the previous stage, make sense? Because here I have G1, here I have G1, G2, things like that, right. Now, this is kind of inverse relationship when we looked at the distortion, if you remember, right. In distortion, what was important? The last stage should be able to, should have the best uh, IP3, the linearity performance. Because the first stage linearity does not really matter because it is handling only small signals. And it is only when you amplify bigger, bigger, bigger and the last stage has to handle the large signal. So, its linearity is very important. So, there is always a trade off in linearity and noise figure. I hope it is clear. Um, the, the insight part is more important. I mean, you do not need to have exact numbers, but you should know, you know, which part is important, okay, when you, when you do the analysis. 
So, uh, first few stages are very critical and after that noise figure does not matter uh, as such ok. So, um, let us see what uh, I want to take one example before we start and that example is if I have a lossy circuit. So, in RF um, um, you know circuits uh, you have a generator and that is delivering certain power and we always use something called attenuators you know as you if you are doing some measurements you will use attenuators because the power output from the generator is too high. Those attenuators are basically they are lossy elements ok, they have resistive dividers pretty much. So, uh, if you look they are called also pads RF pads ok. Now, they come in sizes like 6 dB loss, uh, 10 dB loss or 20 dB etcetera ok. So, these are losses which you put right up front. So, let us take just quick example of what this lossy circuit will do to your noise figure. Uh, it is really important to know that that is why I am going through that with you. So, these are all uh, passive, they are not active circuits, they are all passive circuits, um, reciprocal circuits and power loss L is given by P in divided by P out ok. And this P in is basically available, the word available means what is maximum you can get out of that ok, under match condition ok. So, available source power and P out is available power at output ok. So, we can quickly model this as this is our lossy circuit and this is your R L plus minus V out ok. So, for this lossy circuit uh, and this is let us say your R S and let us say this is your R L. We can we can draw this what is looking a uh, thevenin's equivalent at the output ok like this it is going to look like this R L and this is R out and this is V T H ok. I am I am talking about only this part looking back into the network ok you will have V T H R out and R L. And uh, so, then what is the power delivered input? P in is going to be equal to uh, V in square divided by 4 R s. Is that clear? What is the deliver power delivered? Right? You know why 4 came in, right? Because there is uh, half, uh, you know, there is a power uh, voltage divider over here. And what is the P out going to be? V T H square divided by 4 times, let us say, R out, assuming match condition. Then loss. L is given by V in square divided by V T H square divided by um, times uh, okay, R out divided by R S ok. And uh, so, that is one expression and the other expression is uh, the V n out ok, which is due to this R out that R out is the loss right, because it is uh, the real part of the impedance looking back in that is given by 4 k t R out right. The noise due to this 4 k t R out as 4 uh, uh, R out is 4 k t R out and then you will see the noise at the output in a voltage divider fashion. So, that would get multiplied by R L divided by R L plus R out. So, this is the second definition, uh, we are just drawing two, three equations and I am coming to a conclusion very quickly and the noise, uh, the gain A V, what is gain is going to be uh, this V T H and V in is over here. So, you will get V T H divided by V in times R L divided by R L plus R out ok and that is the gain. So, V T H is looking back this way 
and what we are looking for is a gain at the output. So, R L divided by R L plus R out um, and then um, you know you have gain from input to V T H. Okay. So, now something interesting will fall out and that is when we will stop. So, noise factor of this circuit is going to be total output noise. What is the total output noise? This right because we are looking at this circuit and we are looking at the output impedance, uh, the real part of the output impedance and that will give rise to noise. So, that is going to give look like V n out square and then what is the input uh, noise is going to be V n due to R s square times A v square. Okay. So, we can write uh, the terms that we just did which would be 4 k t r out. I know I am going a little bit fast, but um, if there is a question on the algebra, we can uh, take it up next time or I will review it again. Uh, but let us end with uh, 4 k t r s and a v we already defined here which is v t h divided by v n square and r l divided by r l plus r out square. So, what will happen is if you if you look at this expression right you will you will see you will see some something like this part coming out and that will look like ok it is doing something funny is equal to noise factor is equal to L. If you if you look at the part which is left this part is equal to the loss that we define. Huh? Um, yes, you can assume, but you do not have to I mean it gets cancelled out yeah anyway. So, the key insight here is the the noise factor of a lossy circuit is equal to the loss itself L ok. So, let us say you have a 3 dB attenuator ok or 6 dB attenuator. So, it will have a noise factor which will be 3 or 6 dB and when you put everything in the chain then it will just add on top you cannot if you have an attenuation at the input of the stage then you cannot get better noise figure than that ok. So, you are limited by that. Um, so, one thing before you go I would like you to read um, I am going to send out um, a note um, I will have a reading material and the reason for this is uh, you need to know this, but if I do it in the class it is extremely painful and boring uh, both for me as well as for you. Uh, and uh, I, I want you to kind of do it on your own. Um, I am going to give you the, the exact um, place to look for and we will also provide you with the notes. What I want you to do is write it on a piece of paper yourself and submit it next time because unless I do that you will not go through it and maybe we will give a surprise point or something for that ok. So, really simple analysis the uh, the analysis is basically the next level of noise analysis. Um, I am going to give you an answer you just have to rewrite the answer in your own words and your understanding ok. So, uh, the reading material is in uh, Thomas Lee's book does everybody have this book or no? Yes, no how many do not have this book you do not. So, maybe we will provide the pages for you ok uh, maybe Sumit can just uh, provide the snapshot it is 11.6.1 ok. It is a classical two pore noise theory um, and something that you just have to read understand and I am also going to give you my notes which I have written. So, you can match them and you rewrite them in your own words and whatever insights that you get and I will talk about it in the next class. Sounds good little more of work, but I think that is the way uh, we can make better progress rather than making it painful in the classroom ok just 2-3 pages that is it ok I will see you next time thank you.